Welcome to OPLUS TV. Today we have Daniel Weston, founder of AIMED Capital, a Luxembourg domiciled systematic global macro fund. Now, Daniel, you have a very interesting professional background before you started your hedge fund. Can you tell us about that and what led you into the hedge fund space? Thanks, Greg. So I started trading stocks when I was a teenager. I had a real passion and, and interest in the stock market. I also had skills in coding and, and IT. And when I left high school, I started an IT company in Australia doing network consulting and these sort of things. That, that, that business was really successful and I was trading Australian stocks all the way in between. When I was 21, I had a, a big blow up in my trading account, which taught me a lot about risk management, but also taught me that this is what I wanted to do forever. Then uh, a few years later, I was able to exit the IT company when I was 23 years old. And this was a fantastic opportunity for me to just put all my, all my sort of focus and energies towards trading. And uh, I was traveling through Europe and, and met a guy called Willem Schroeder, who was running a, a Macquarie Bank in Germany. And he's a fantastic guy and met him and we hit it off really quickly. I told him about the experiences of, of me running the business and then of my also personal trading experiences. And he gave me a chance as his assistant portfolio manager running a long only Australian equity fund. Once I started working with him, I discovered that I wasn't a stock picking guy, I was more of a macro guy and I had a real fascination with macro moves in the, sort of economic moves in the markets and how they uh, affected asset classes essentially. So I'd sort of use my IT and coding skills and my love for, for the markets to then spend a lot of late nights at the office building models to trade in a really systematic process, my own capital essentially based on something that I wanted as a really systematic and repeatable methodical approach to managing my own money. It was fantastic because he gave me the chance to do that. I was showing him my work and he sort of supported me through that. And then it was a process of putting up good trading performance myself. I then had a newsletter which I uh, was publishing and, and people sort of started hearing of my calls and the, the support that I was getting from people in Germany and people reading my newsletter. Let me launch the fund last year in September. So do you have success trading your own money with your systematic models as an assistant portfolio manager? Yes, yeah, so, so I, sort of, I started putting these models together in 2007 and what I was really interested in was the correlation between growth, inflation and how asset prices were changing. They were, what I found was there were all these distinct relationships from the work I was doing which started to make me feel very bearish in late 2007. Growth was coming off, inflation was sort of persisting higher in the data that I was looking at and it made me get very defensive. So I, I started trading defensively in my own my own portfolio and and then 2008 happened which is an enormous correction which during that time I was building my models more because obviously it was a wild time in the markets and I was sort of trying to use all, all, all the conviction that I was building in these sort of a longer term growth and inflation models as to how they could be best adapted to trade the, the current market. 2008 was a was a was a time where growth continually fell off which in, in my own models, which was leaving me defensive. And then in 2009, on March 13, uh, that was the first time that my models showed that growth was bottoming out and picking up and, and left me calling a long equity position, which was then put into the newsletter that I was publishing and Willem Schroeder was publishing, which was then identified by some Swiss family officers, which, uh, which heard about that call and it ended up being a really successful call on, uh, on to, to buy back equities in, in uh, March 2009. So what was the timing? I know you launched your fund in September of last year. How did the timing work out that that was the optimal time to launch? And tell us a little more about your investment strategy as it is now. Yeah, sure. So, so as far as the launch goes, it was difficult to, to launch. I, I sort of, uh, I wanted to be a hedge fund manager when I was sort of 18, 19 years old, but I didn't know how or what and, and what the, all the moving parts were to doing it. I started going to conferences and trying to meet people because essentially I was building my models in front of a Bloomberg terminal rather than meeting the market or working in the market. So I didn't really know what I needed to do, but the regulatory had hurdles, compliance and all these sort of things was something that I came up against. But essentially I spent five years building out my models and trading my own money to build that conviction in myself before I launched and, and raised, the, uh, raised the money to start the fund. And the fund was launched with my own money, friends and family, and two institutional investors out of, uh, out of Switzerland. So 
So, Daniel, where do you find your edge in the market where you're trying to outperform? So, my investment edge or belief has been built out of all my experience as a private investor. So, essentially, I had this belief that it was growth and inflation which was driving asset classes, and those being the big macro drivers which were affecting asset classes all around the world at any one point in time. Because I've got this belief that you generate wealth or compound and create wealth by owning the right asset class for the prevailing economic environment. So that's what led me to really want to discover ways of best uh, working out where growth and inflation were to then be able to make my asset allocation decisions on, on that. So essentially with all the work I was doing on correlations and back testing that data, I came up with a set of rules which were very broad that I could run my investment process by. And that was when growth is strengthening and inflation's weak, own equities. When growth is strong and inflation strong, own commodities. When inflation is strong but growth is weak, own uh, inflation-protected securities. And when growth and inflation are both weak, you want to be owning government bonds. So they were the, they were the broad rules that I came up with. And then I used my skills as a coder to build that technology out so that I could automate that systematic process of of uh, implementing that strategy to um, to put capital to work. What is your theory on risk management and where does that provide value for investors? So I guess with risk management are looking at it in three ways. So firstly, it's economic liability risk management. Uh, secondly, it's portfolio risk management and then the trade, the actual trading instrument risk management. Uh, so the, the, me looking at growth and inflation, I think this is the import, most important part of the risk management process because there's not always times where you should be long one specific asset class. There's you know, growth and inflation, the way that the way they trend and the way I see them trending means that it's not always a good time to be long equities and not always a good time to own bonds, not always a good time to own commodities. So I think that's the first process of risk management. If if growth is is looking as if it's weak, then I don't want to be owning equities at that time. So the economic liability hedge is built into my risk management. Secondly, on the portfolio approach, I want to weight my trades mainly based on volatility so that I get equal, if I've got equal conviction in two different instruments which have very different volatility, I want to be uh, weighting those trades effectively to make sure that my, the risk in the portfolio is very closely monitored by, by myself and, and uh, at the portfolio level. And then with each trade that I have on, each instrument has a trailing stop loss. So I'm tight with these stop losses, and that's essentially because when trades aren't working as anticipated, I want to cut those losses very fast. And as trades do work in my favor and conviction grows in, in positions that I've got on, I run trailing stop losses. So uh, effectively, I want to have large winners in a smaller amount of trades and losses in more trades which are cut quickly so they don't uh, affect the portfolio. So what kind of investors are you targeting with your strategy? Is it family offices? Is it other institutional investors? I know you said you had two institutional investors. Who are you targeting? The family office investor is, is someone that I'm targeting at the moment. One of my first and, and largest investors was a family office in Zurich. The reason they came on board, I was fortunate enough to get them as a partner early because they were reading the newsletter, which they saw my call to go long equities in March 2009, and they were just following my models and and how I was developing as a private investor over the time. So when I launched the fund, they were first in the door, uh, which was fantastic. I was very lucky to get them and uh, really value that commitment that they made to me. The reason why it's important for them is that they like seeing the transparency and the sort of bespoke nature of how I build my portfolio and, and we can get on the phone and, and discuss the strategy at, at hand, how they're seeing the markets, how I'm seeing the markets. And hey, having that really close relationship is, has been really good for both sides. I've enjoyed having an early supporter. They enjoy seeing the transparency of my portfolio, and that's something that I base my whole business on. So, as an emerging manager, what kind of questions do you do you get from larger in investors, from family offices and institutional investors? Being an emerging manager is hard. I mean, it's uh, if if it was easy, everyone would be an emerging manager. There's a lot of highly talented people out there that are that are managing money. But essentially, you have to be passionate about the business, but you also have to be passionate about running a business. And the the entrepreneurial approach that I've always always had. You know, starting my first company at 18, essentially I, I always wanted to be putting my own, um, my own uh, convictions on the line and being accountable to those convictions to build something big. So, so it's, it's a process where people don't believe in you until you put up a solid performance or a solid track record and they assume that uh, things are going to be difficult for an emerging manager and that teething process has to be sorted through and, and that's true. But, but I'm here with, with my own capital in the fund, my, my own capital in, in my business. I love what I do and I've got the entrepreneurial approach to, to building a big sustainable business. 
and I've started that process now and, and the journey's been fantastic so far and I'm looking for believers in, in myself as an entrepreneur to run, to run a business but also in, in managing a, a hedge fund portfolio. So I'm in a great position where I can leverage my skills and, and passions all at once and I, I know that there's, there's a, a lot of success ahead and, and a lot of excitement about, uh, sort of what's to come in, in the, in the industry if, um, if you do the hard work early. The thing for being an emerging manager is that you, as an investor, you just get access because you can't get on the phone and talk to a hedge fund legend or you can't invest in a hedge fund legend because <laughs> these guys are all closed, like their, their funds are closed. But you can get on the phone to me and talk to me about the, the, the market or talk to me about what my investment approach is sort of from a day-to-day -day basis rather than, uh, rather than uh, getting a newsletter once a quarter from someone that they've never met, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> so so uh, the, the emerging manager approach there just means access and transparency is at a far greater level than uh, investing in a much larger shop. Tell me a little more about structuring your portfolio to achieve maximum performance. Are you looking for a lot of diversified trades? Or are you looking at kind of the big macro swings? I'm trying to catch the big macro swings. That, that, that's, that's what I'm here to do. And essentially, I've built this technology platform, which is looking at global growth, global inflation. I'm getting as much data as possible, which feeds into my models to find these trends in where growth and inflation is going. Now, I do that at a global level, looking at where the world's heading. And I trade commodities based on that, based on that global, global view. And then I also use that same fundamental sort of technology approach to look at countries. So I'm looking at 23 different countries in the model, working out where the growth and inflation is there, and then working out what asset class in which country am I bullish and bearish on. So, so as I said earlier, that, that's in equities, it's in 10-year government bonds, it's in commodities, it's in currencies as well. And I'll base my base all the all the positions on, on that growth and inflation data first. Now from there, we, we drill down into a whole array of different trades which are diversified. It's a barbell approach where I'm assuming that everything in the world is positively correlated. So I want to base the portfolio on, on that base case assumption which helps manage my risk. Secondly, it's conviction in every one of my trades is built by a long process of that systematic, methodical, repeatable approach to my investing. So every trade that hits my portfolio have got, has got good reasoning behind it. Then from there, the risk management of each position is is important, but it also leaves me sometimes with a highly diversified portfolio and other times taking uh, sort of larger macro directional positions. Uh, so, so there's times where it sort of ebbs and flows. There, there could be periods where I've got strong conviction in a, in a bullish environment in Asia or in a bearish environment in Europe, and there might be times where I might be very bullish or very bearish in one directional angle. The, the way that you know, the way that I counteract that is by just assuming that everything is positively correlated so that I can target my risk management on a portfolio level, which ensures that if conviction is right, then I want every trade in my portfolio to be there for a good reason, and then have very tight uh, trailing stop losses on each of those positions to ensure that uh, when I get the big macro, macro directional uh, call correct, then I make lots of money for my investors. And when I'm diversified, I'm preserving capital for my investors. So if you're fully invested and the market goes south, how do you respond? How do you manage the fund? The whole reason for everything I've done in building this methodical process is so that I don't trade on emotion. I, I trade on conviction that are built through a long list of uh, investment processes. So I always stick to that same same conviction in all my trades and there's no sort of discretionary overlay or no emotional overlay to, uh, to, to any of my trading. When the market goes south, I've got my trailing stop losses in there on the screen so I exit positions without any discretion. If, if it hits my trailing stop loss price, then, then I'm out and, and waiting for that re-entry point, which is entirely systematic. Again, that, that this is a function of my experience as a private investor and an experience of all my work saying stick to your convictions, stick to the process and continue running that because the, the panic in the markets or the sell-offs, uh, they generally make you do, and they make the emotional investor do the wrong thing at the wrong time. But these sort of panics and sell-offs also provide the biggest opportunities. When the market spikes higher or spikes lower, it's, yeah, it's, it's an opportunity as long as you keep sticking to your, to your repeatable systematic approach, and, and that's what I try and do.